Hi everybody, this is Jason, the host of the Castle of Horror podcast. It's worth noting that we recorded this several years ago before we upgraded our sound equipment, so you'll hear some cracks and pops and hisses occasionally, and for that, we're very sorry. Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our Haunted House retrospective with The Changeling, starring George C. Scott. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have. So a warning, spoilers ahead from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, creator of the Alex Van Helsing novels. With me from Austin is Tony Salvaggio, lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars and co-creator of the comic Psycom from Tokyo Pop and Clockworks from Humanoids. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man, from Monsterverse Comics and soon something else. Can I still say that? Can I? Can I? Can I? Uh, you can. You can. And soon, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that later. Yes. <laughs> if I'm awesome. wrong about that, we're live. You can't. Yeah, I, it sounded to me like you were saying yes. Whatever. Shifty. Okay, you know. Shifty. I'm a shifty guy. <laughs> and finally, also joining us from Denver, as always, color commentary from attorney Julia Guzman. Say hello. Hello. Hello, our spiritual guidance, Joya Guzman. <laughs> Joya, what's what's great about having you on is that you always see the uh, the codependence in the character. Yeah, yeah the addictions and the codependencies. <laughs> so okay, not projecting at all. According to Wikipedia, <laughs> the Changeling is a 1980. I did not know this Canadian American horror film directed by Peter Medak and starring George C. Scott and Trish Vanderveer, Scott's real-life wife. The story is based upon events that writer Russell Hunter said he experienced while he was living in the Henry Treat Rogers Mansion here in lovely Denver, Colorado. Um, all right. I, and this is, this is a movie I have been wanting to talk about for a long time, and I don't know what the group's reactions to it are going to be. We haven't really gauged it yet. I can't believe I got you all to watch this film. Um, first impressions... Julia, we haven't started with you in a while, so let's go. Julia, Tony, Drew, and then I'll go. Julia, first impressions, The Changeling. Oh, I thought this was a great, creepy movie. Um, I, I really liked it. Uh, shocking and horrible. At first I was thinking, oh, good, this is going to be a movie where we don't have to worry about any kids, except for the kid that, you know, dies at the beginning. But then I'm like, now it's just Dorsey Scott, there's no kids. And then, of course, there's kids. I'm like, damn it. Yeah. So kids. <laughs> But uh, but it's a really good good creepy movie. I don't understand, and I'll never understand why he needs to live in this ginormous house all by himself. But that's whatever. That that is what it is. Yeah. Um, rent yes, is cheap. Great. Yeah, yeah. I guess. But the, well, rent, <laughs> I mean, I don't want a giant house, no matter how cheap the the rent is, because that's a lot of it's lonely. Anyway. Yeah. So yes, good movie. All right, outstanding. Um, who did I say would go next? Tony. First impression. The I this movie is really creepy. I think it's got a lot of good stuff. There's a it's some wonkiness, but um, also, again, sound design plays a huge role of yeah. awesomeness in it. I really like the movie. Um, I was a little disconnected this time, and I've seen it a bunch of times, so I'm not sure what was different in this viewing. But uh, it's, you know, it's a nice, intense movie. kind of feels like maybe it should be a, a novel, but it's not based on a novel. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I really like it. Uh, I think it's... I think it's pretty awesome. It's a good, you know. I think this and the haunting would make a great double feature. Oh, I think that's I think that's right. Um, so, did you watch it this time on YouTube or did you watch it on? Um, I can't remember. Um, I don't own it, which I should. And I looked for it. Yeah, so I can't. Yeah, I can't remember where I found it. Because it's it, on YouTube. You can. Yeah. You can find it there. Yeah. I'm usually try not to if it's not if it's available. Just I, you know, I try not to. No, no, I agree pirate. completely. But when, this is one of those ones that's actually very, very hard to find. I it mean, is a pain. I mean, we're lucky we have stuff in, you know, we can get stuff in Austin. But it is, I was surprised that no one was streaming it on all the streaming places that, that yeah. you know. I think Google Play is streaming it. I can't. I have to look again where, where I found it. No, that's but, right. Google Google um, Play is, but uh, I don't have any devices that play Google Play. And that's a... And yeah. That a well, I mean, I, I have a meet, like, I have a PC that I can hook up to things. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, without Google Play, it would have been real pain. So that's unfortunate because it would well, be what, what, great what, what if one of What strikes me as strange is Google owns YouTube, right? Yeah. So YouTube, if Google Play is renting the movie, how come YouTube isn't right? Because you know YouTube also rent, rents movies. And I do have a YouTube app on my various. Yeah. Platforms. 
Well, I'm surprised they haven't. In that case, I'm surprised they haven't shut down the YouTube one. It just makes no sense. But but yeah. you know, I I I don't know. The rights that are attached to some of these older films, especially these that are like not so old that they're like obviously in the public domain, but instead they're just old enough that they're complicated, is uh, that's that's always tough. Okay, Drew, first impressions, The Changeling. Well, I didn't. Okay, first off, I thought this movie was great, especially compared to last week. So I, I'm going to start out by saying this. So any of the following statement following statements are not uh, viewed as criticism so I'm going to I'm going to talk about what I liked about it very briefly I had no complaints uh, for one this is a this is a haunted house movie where you actually get to see a lot of the house which I greatly appreciate a lot of these movies yeah. you kind of only end up seeing one or two rooms I, I all like sets. they're all sets everything in the house I know they're all sets but it seems like you for some reason this seemed like there was you get the more of a layout of the house Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, George C. Scott is amazing. Uh, it, it's it's very atmospheric. However, this movie did not scare me at all. It did not creep me out at all. I thought this was more honestly, uh, outside of the, the stuff at the beginning of the car accident, which I, I have to admit, I kind of had some post-traumatic stress mm-hmm. reactions to, but, um, which was upsetting, right. but not scary per se. Um, however, to me, this is more of like a mystery movie than an actual horror mm-hmm. film you know it's more like George C. Scott he, George C. Scott never even really seems that freaked out about what's going on in the house he's, he's more just like what's going on okay it's a ghost how do I deal with this which I, I, I kind of found very yeah. refreshing you know I liked that that you know you had a protagonist in a, in a quote unquote horror film that was more proactive and was not fumbling around like a, like a, like a dumbass most of the time you, you know this guy he was actually on point, and I I really dug that. <laughs> no, that's that's wonderful. Okay, and uh, and I I hope that as we go along, you'll tell us what like other things that disconnected for you, because apparently when you dislike a movie, that's enormously popular with our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I did not dislike this movie. That is that is not that is not an appearance. We need I to watch more movie movies. Was, I actually thought this movie was great. Hate. I just didn't. <laughs> we gotta we gotta find more movies that for some reason. Tony or Jason or Julia adores and Drew hates, or or and then and then that's comedy gold, baby. Um, I, appear, apparently, and I, I you know there's plenty of movies I dislike. Most of them are more modern <laughs> horror films. If we were to if we were if you if we were to watch like the Saw franchise, I would eviscerate it. But I, this I thought was very it. elegant and gothic and. Wonderful, and you know, I, I, I guess I'm calling it an older horror film. It's not really like it came out in my lifetime. It's it's older. It's not like as old as some of the movies I watch. But I did not dislike this movie. It just didn't scare me. There's, but a lot of the horror films I watch, I don't actually scare me. So that's not really a, a, a criticism <laughs> per se. Yeah, it's not. It doesn't. Yeah, it's not like a. I don't know. I really thought that some of the other movies we've seen were scarier, but this was super creepy. Is what I, there are some things, but even the things that are scary are still just creepy. Like I, I want to skip just to my favorite part, just because why not? Um, I love, love, love. What was that when this this ball that his daughter had uh, comes gets somehow manages to get away from his closed off desk and go upstairs and bounce down the stairs. And so then he takes it, gets in his car, drives somewhere, throws it off a bridge, comes back, walks in the door, and it bounces right back down the stairs yes. again. I mean, that stuff is great. It was and it's scary not, it's and not like scary, like time. you're like, oh, my God. You know, it's just like, holy crap, that is so freaking, you know, like, well, here, here I go with freaking. Whoever it was that was commenting that saying that I, I, I overused that word, I think. So I tried not to use that. I wonder what. Or an word, alternative. Oh, I, I think somebody, the friggin' was the one last thing. I mean, I would love to see a word cloud of of the show yeah, yeah. to see what what people <laughs> actually overuse. I probably overused the word interesting. Hmm. You know, I I I don't know. Um, let's get right into it. Actually, there's some really great things to talk about in this movie. And and once again, the the story is about this this brilliant character who you know is a is a well-known composer and he rents this giant house in order to sort of start over a new life after his uh, after his family dies in a horrible accident so pervading the whole thing is this this idea of loss and grief and how i mean uh, you know i just to kick off this conversation about that i really appreciated how well that was handled 
at this guy that George, and George C. Scott is probably perfectly cast for it. And I want to get in a second to the character of George C. Scott. Maybe that maybe this ties together here, and we'll do it here. But you know, you have a character who is however old he is. You know, I Joy and I thought that he was like. <laughs> I thought he was like he, seventy. He literally thought he and looked great for his seventy. For seventy, and it turns out he's like fifty-two, fifty-three, right. something like that. He thought oh he looked gosh. like a fabulous seventy-two-year-old. He instead is a <laughs> terrible-looking fifty-two-year-old. But whatever, you know, he's, yeah, he's yeah. Been, he looks like you know, he's, it's because of all that he's been through, you know. And Wait, Drew wanted to say something. Go ahead, Drew. You talk about how well cast he is. One of the things that. With the grieving aspect of this, yeah. because you have a guy like George C. Scott, who is a masculine man, you know, he's not he's not effeminate, you know, he's definitely not, uh, you know, even though he's a musician, they didn't they chose not to, to, to portray him as a cliched sort right. of uh, like like uh, sort of romanticized, you know, very pretty. No, he's a very, of a he's a very masculine, confident. And professional musician. And you know, so. so when you have those scenes of him like breaking down and sobbing, yeah, I feel like that 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 hammers it more than if you had somebody that was like on the nose, like oh, sensitive artist type. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he. I, I. He's really enjoyable to watch. One thing I, I think I really like about this movie is that George C. Scott turns in this performance that seems extremely natural and measured. And his way, the way that this character talks about his own personal loss is uh, is very real. I completely believe him because there's a point where he's visiting some some university friends and he's at their house and he's sitting on their you know their heart you know and and he's explaining sort of the process of grief, grief and then it took him a while to even sort of be able to acknowledge out loud that his that his family was dead. But there's a robotic, even though he's communicating to people. So he's, he's got it down that that's important, that he has to communicate about what he's going through. His communication of it is still robotic and detached. This is literally the most reserved human I have ever seen in a, in a that's, home. That's incredibly realistic to somebody that's that, that, that has post-traumatic stress, though. Like, I, as somebody oh, that's been through been through an accident, you know, not unlike, well, not like the one here, but an auto accident in which a a family member was lost. Like, I, you know, you you talked so much about relating to Ethan Hawke last week. Like, I really related to this guy, and I thought his his delivery was just spot on. That's wonderful. That's, that's, I mean, it, and I, that, the great thing is, and I'm I'm very sorry, as, as always, but I'm glad that you can bring that insight to this. Well, you know, it's there, so I don't want to talk about it. Right. No, precisely. Well, I mean, I wonder if... The, the, so the movie posits two things. One, that a person who is going through this kind of grief, and it's horrible. His his daughter, his beautiful daughter and his beautiful wife, both die in, in just sort of a, a screwy, icy road accident. And... You know, now he has moved across the country. But he's just, again, I mean, like I said before, how, why does someone in that situation who already feels so alone in the world move into this giant house? You always have, yeah. you know, all the other movies you've ever seen, people go, it feels so lonely in this big house all by myself. And here he moves into a much bigger house than anybody has. Well, I think he's you know, being defined. Well, first of all, he says he wants a place to rattle around in. Go ahead. But that's what it yeah. Is. Yeah, I think that's the big thing is they, they kind of fix him up with, like, hey, you know, this place is, like, he has all this stuff. I don't know if he realizes how big it is until he's already kind of made the... You know, the, when you're, when you're like, grieving, though, that. you do, part of you does want solitude. And, I, you know, when I was, again, I hate to relate too much and make uh-huh. this all about me, me, me. But when I was going through very much what this guy was going through, I did live in a very large house, and I just loved rattling around the different, exactly those words, rattling around the different rooms and just kind of being lost with myself. Well, so I know, I, addiction literature, the, the, that's one of the things you do when you're, when you're grappling with, with an overwhelming emotion and with, the, with something that really, truly has you in its grip is you have a tendency to isolate yourself. Because you feel like it's not, you feel unworthy of seeing other people. And also that other people are unworthy of seeing you. You just literally detach yourself. But what's interesting here is he wants a house that he can rattle around in and work on his music. So there's that isolation thing. But he's doing it in the context of, I'm also putting myself back out in the world. You know, I'm going to go take a job at this kind of beautiful university, supposedly in Seattle. I think it's actually in Canada somewhere. And, uh, you know, so he's, and he's opening it up. He's having students over and stuff. 
But I agree. It is a huge, lonely. Uh, so is this a real house at, at all? No, no, no. No, they, they built the facade onto a, a modern structure, and then all the interiors are set. So the, the front of it, Canada, not Vancouver. real, the inside. No. Out, I was completely, completely snowed by this house. Mm-hmm. I, I did believe it. Yeah, it's done really well. Like the, yeah. the set dressers and everybody, like, I mean, that's a really nice set. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The outside, I mean, that's an amazing facade. I hope they didn't. Well, they spent two hundred thousand dollars on it. It's, <laughs> it. That's amazing. Oh. I mean, it looks like, you know, because you pick a, like a big house, like you see in um, the Legend of Hell House, that was a real house, and uh, you know, the one on Downton Abbey is a real house. There's plenty of giant houses out there that that you could mm-hmm. use, but uh, you know, I guess they they just had a vision. They couldn't find anything that they wanted. But, I mean, yeah. they probably they probably wanted to be in Vancouver, so they didn't find anything they wanted in Vancouver. Right. That's pretty cool. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the, the impression, the, the, the fictional house that this is, is just really, truly the size of one of the great houses of, of Britain. It's not like the big ramshackle house that they bought in, in uh, the movie we watched a couple, of, uh, a couple of days, The Conjuring. The Conjuring, that's a big house, and it probably has, like, I don't know, five rooms or something. This is not like that. This is like a hotel. It's like something that a lord of a manor would live in. It's something like Bruce Wayne would live in. It's pretty cool. Um, I remember watching this movie and, you know, just being struck. Like, as a kid, I've been watching this movie for many years. And one of the things that, that I was really struck by, um, getting back to the coolness of George C. Scott, there's a moment when the, the haunting really starts to become real. And he uh, and and the haunting basically the reason the house had picked him is because of that grief that uh, that Drew was referring to. That basically that the movie suggests that that at least in this movie's world, um, ghosts are most interested in connecting with people who are on an emotional wavelength with them. Is that new? Have we seen that before? I'm, I'm I think that's a very Again, gothic idea. I mean, it seems like something that would yeah. be at home and like, you know, like going all the way back to like, like ground Poe or something. Yeah. And I yeah. think when you talk about what the meaning of the word changeling is, according to the, the Wikipedia definition, <laughs> it's a creature found in European folklore and folk religion. It's typically described as being the offspring of a fairy, troll, elf, or other legendary creature that has been secretly left in the place of a human child. Yes. Sometimes the term is also used to refer to a child who, ha- who was taken. It's the swap child meaning of the term. And so, right. um, yeah, so that's kind of what the idea is here is that, you know, this. And the mystery is leading up to that. You're not quite sure why it's the changeling until you yeah. find it out and you're like, oh. You know, because, you know, like Drew was saying, the, it's more of a mystery in a lot of ways mm-hmm. than it is straight up supernatural. But I think the mystery is really great. I, I, well, I, love, yeah. I love detective stories, so I did, it, that didn't bother me at all. It, it actually goes gothic detective. Oh, go ahead. He goes from well, it goes from haunted house story to detective story. It sort of starts right. out as the haunted house where you just kind of like creepy sounds and what's going on in the ball, and then it becomes okay. Oh, there's a a, a ghost. What does it want? How do we, how do we get? Okay, Jason's trying to destroy his. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, Maybe I just yeah, add sound effects to the. <laughs> what do you want from me? This is like, what are you talking about? That wasn't me. Um, yeah, and uh, they just, you know, it's like they, they become. It becomes about how are we gonna put this ghost to rest? I don't know if you're ready to talk about the story of the ghost. Do we want to go into? Well, that no, or? yeah, I, th- I, I think we can do that. The, um, the, uh, the, that's the other thing that fits into this ghost mysteries in my mind. Um, and, and by the way, in a moment we'll talk about prestige horror and what, what I think that is. But ghost mysteries, which des- this definitely fits into, the whole idea is there is a haunting. Somebody goes into a new situation, be it a, a shopping mall or a new house or a hotel or whatever it is, and there's a ghost doing funky things, and so they investigate it, and what makes the ghost go away is solving the mystery. Period. Actually, actually, the ghost doesn't go away. At the end, it looks like it's the ghost to go away, and then the ghost... Well, no, I mean, I mean generally... <laughs> yeah, in general. <laughs> generally, and, and, and okay, but uh, yeah. I, I, see, I, I, I a little bit disagree with you, and I'll tell yeah. you why. Well, we'll talk about that later, though. But, we'll talk but, about the end uh, but because as far as I'm concerned, the haunting's over when they solve the mystery. <laughs> and that's normally the way it works in, in, ghost, uh, in ghost mysteries, and it's the way it works here. And you know, there's a lot of times where it'll be like, all you've got to do is find the, find the ghost's body, and then the body, the, the ghost will stop. In this case, the ghost wants something else. But usually, basically, it involves, involves this, this mystery investigation. And, in fact, what I love, uh, do you guys love the technology of, of the – of the actual mystery solving that they use here. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. I, mean, I, I always love I always love a good séance, 
and, and a good and it's some automatic writing. That's always fun. Oh, but what but what's cool is that then he's recording. Now it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that they would he would record it and then play it by himself without the media. I, I really feel like the media would have been there for Explain that. Explain what you're talking about. Okay, we, we, so yeah. so he invites the media in to say, um, hey, what's going on in this house? And so she contacts the spirit, and it's this little boy. And another little thing that annoyed me is I wish they would have used a real little boy's voice instead of a, a woman. I'm assuming it's a woman's voice. But anyway, they've got this little this. So she contacts the little boy through the automatic writing. So she says, "What's your name? You know, who are you? What is your name?" Whatever. And she finally gets Joseph is the name and a few other things that she writes. And then she just leaves. And he goes, "Okay, well now." Um, to, oh, he says he wants help, but she never asks what kind of help. But anyway, she wants ghost help from John. The help, ghost yeah. says the ghost says help is what they want. Help, 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 John, help me. So um, then she leaves, and so now, but he has recorded. John, the the main character, has recorded this um, this session with his really great because he's a, a, a musician, so he's got really great recording equipment. And he plays it back, and he can hear, just like in so many ghost stories, which I just think is wonderful, the very soft voice in the background of yeah. the thing. So he turns it way up, and he can hear this, this quote-unquote boy saying, um, you know, Joseph, you know, my name is Joseph. And then he's like, all the things he's saying. And so that's awesome. I, I, again, I think that if it were a modern movie, there would have been a whole team at analyzing that and listening to it. But in this case, it's just him. And it's and I guess it's appropriate because he's, it's all about he's the one that's going to help this kid. He's the one who's got to figure it out that nobody else is going to. And he's doing do it. it with this. He's using, in the course of this investigation, he's using reel-to-reel tape. Mm-hmm. He's using footwork with his new girlfriend who just shows up. I love, uh, well, okay, continue along the thought. Footwork, they're going from place to place. They're interviewing people in person. Unlike the Skype with Sinister, he has to actually go to a local university and talk in person to a human professor somewhere. He has to go to the library and have a human bring him microfish, which he has to, like, scroll around on this mechanical wheel. To you guys are probably too young to have ever used microfish. Did you ever use microfish? I did. You did? Yeah. No. We're, all, we're all, I, no. yeah. I'm Drew, all, you did? Not, I mean, briefly, it depends on the place, too, because like, not everybody, I think it was a tail end, but, like, you know, living where I did in Mississippi, like, you know, you I said before, I, there was still, you know, a lot of the card catalog was still yeah. kind of like that at some libraries. And then, you know, the, the kind of one you slipped under like a piece, piece of glass and moved it around. And then also, you know, I mean, when I moved there, <laughs> we still had a party line and other places mm-hmm. didn't even know what the hell that was. So, right. we had you know, yes, college, yeah. my, my, my hometown wasn't even that high tech. So. <laughs> You know, like I, I, we, no, so no. <laughs> I, I absolutely used microfish, and I always pretended that I was Colcheck the Night Stalker. This was in the in the eighties, <laughs> and I, I wanted to be awesome. Darren McGavin because he was always looking things up on old microfish. Or some person would bring out, he would go to what was called the newspaper morgue, which was where they kept one copy of each newspaper going back as far as the newspaper was. So he would ask for, he would have a slip of paper, he'd ask for an article, and somebody would bring out the newspaper itself and lay it out and look at it. Those kinds of sort of brick and mortar, you know, mud and blood means of research. I love that stuff. I mean, I it's it's really it's really neat to see it, and it, it, it's one of the things I liked about the Conjuring is that it places, you know, it's aware of how people how people work in the old analog world, and this is and this is really in it. Um, so well, it does make it seem different. more like a, a detective story too, you no, know, it, where it totally totally does. Mm-hmm. In a way, it's like. It, it, the only thing that makes it not like a Kolchak the Night Stalker kind of story is the fact that he has undergone a personal tragedy that makes him more, that in the conceit of the story, he's more susceptible to the ghost. But if you took that, that out, if it was just a divorced dad moving across the country to start a new career in Seattle, I think it would basically just play like a cult check episode, you know? Well, also, I mean, there's a lot going on, too, that's kind of interesting because the ghost, it really picks up around the time he finally kind of is. Cause he's not really, he's going there to move on with his life, but, I, you know, you don't get the impression he's there to, like, you know, meet a new wife or anything, girlfriend yeah, not or anything like that. And no, so no. when that kind of starts to happen is around the time when things really start to pick up so he's changing and it all kind of picks up from there also i love he's jersey scott's a great like when he's in his teacher role yeah he's a really awesome teacher too like you know it's one of those like teachers you would see in fame or you know yeah. paper chase kind of teachers and he does it really well it's really yeah he's really funny cool. 
I like he, his character. He gets a lot. laughs when he's when he's addressing yeah. this giant auditorium of students. We see him at one point with a, a sort of a smaller class, uh, some sort of master class. And he's got like literally in his own parlor. You know, he has he has like what must be some really great students. Yeah, it's um, just a little chamber orchestra type of thing. Yeah, he's a little mini- that was. It's so cool, and it's also cool to see him being skilled. You know, to see that this character is supposed to be really the top of his game as far as being, you know, a, a master composer and and, and, a, and a teacher. You're right. That that kind of stuff just gives me just a really positive feeling when I watch this. I I, I love watching these movies that show like confident people who are good at what they do. You know, and and uh, you know, it, which you know I know is kind of. It, I guess it's kind of silly because it, it closes off a lot of a lot of opportunities. But having him be so good means that the only thing that's really wrong with him right now is just the fact that emotionally he's really busted and and, and beginning to heal. But I want to talk about the girlfriend. So he comes to you have to put girlfriend in quotes because she's not really quote his unquote. girlfriend. Well, I so let's talk about that. So so George C. Scott again, who at 52 looks fantastic for 70, <laughs> has come. <laughs> has come to Seattle, and uh, he immediately develops a just sort of devoted friend from this the real estate agent who finds the house for him. And the friend is played by this, I think, you know, really sort of hot, like, uh, I, I don't know, what, what is, what is, what's the, the phrase? This woman of a certain age, played by Trish Vanderveer, who is like a local, I don't know, historian woman, Who's part of the? She's part of the historical society. She rides horses. She's. <clears throat> she reminds me of Grace from uh, the original Annie. From you know the Annie yes. that we all know. Oh yeah, no, that was Anne Reinking, and mm-hmm. yeah, she has a Re- Anne Reinking thing going along. And it's kind of funny because yeah, this actress is is Trish Vanderveer, who has a certain sort of I don't know a certain snobbiness about her that is charming. It's a snobbiness that is unaware that she is snobby. She's aristocratic seeming. Yes, I think yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. You know, and and there's this wonderful, you know, she's like been very helpful to him. And there's a point where she comes over to bring like he said he he's hinted that something is weird, but she hasn't picked up on that. But he's like, you know, I'd love to get some of you know some of the paperwork for the house. And so she comes by with a big portfolio of papers. She goes, you know, I pulled this stuff and I brought it to you. And she's wearing her writing habit. Because she knows that if you know one of the best ways to get somebody to do something with you is to like present an activity. So she comes over wearing a writing <laughs> habit, so that he can he can go. Oh, were you going writing? It's the neatest, most sweet, innocent little romance among middle-aged people that I I I, I really really enjoyed seeing this. They don't ever kiss. No, they don't kiss. It, it nothing nothing happens. That's what's really well. Yeah. I mean, that begs the question of whether or not it would be appropriate for a man in his emotional state to to really well, we don't start making know how, it how long it's been because he says he says that <clears throat> he he marks that that something happened. I can't remember. How does he put it, Jason? That when he talks about um, that he was like he said he finally assessing. realized he was able to say they're gone, they're gone, they're gone, and he goes that was four months ago. So yeah, so we don't know how long he grieved before he came to the point where he just went. Okay, I accept it. Like that's that final stage of grief. I accept that they are gone. He may have been there a year. I mean, we don't really know. So it could be that he's he's at a good point. But it's true us. that he's still. Uh, Drew may be right. I mean, he, she may be very sensitive about not pushing things. Which is all of this is kind of funny. She's sort of pursuing him. Let's face it. If if she were not uh, if she were not placing herself literally right in front of him at every moment in this movie, it's not as though he would be calling her up. And saying, you know, I'm bored tonight in my house the size of a shopping. No, place. you'd be at home writing music and crying. And, right. You know, I honestly like. You know, you talk about okay, maybe it's a year. He, he's been. You know, he's okay. It's not like they just died. Right. Like they were. Like it was a terrible. Like this is a guy yeah. that has post-traumatic stress disorder that right. can go on for years. Some. You know, know some people right. struggle with it their entire life. Mm-hmm. And it, like. I don't know. Like, I, 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 again, I found it very relatable and very interesting. I, I wish, honestly, in some ways, it had been more part of the dialogue of the yeah. film and and this relationship. You know, like, I mean, it is. It is. I'm not saying it's badly written as it is. And, you know, and and honestly, at the point this movie was made, they probably wouldn't have been really ready to address a subject like that. But 
you know, I, I did find myself wishing that, that, you know, it would be something that the, that the, the, the woman, you know, kind of, but it would have talked to him more about and, you know, there sure had been more of that stuff. I mean, yeah, this is where you wish for, honestly, something more like a series where, where there could be different steps along the way, where there could be an episode where he's particularly moody about something and then, and then uh, you know, he ends up, you know, having a speech about, about that particular thing. And we can see a slower process where she brings him out. Now, I recognize that it plays, while at the same time it recognizes very well the, the crushing damage that grief does to the guy. At the same time, it does have the, everything I'm saying about what's charming about Trish Vandeveer literally throwing herself in front of George C. Scott at every moment really has to do with a kind of a, I think, what a problematic understanding of what women are supposed to do with men, which is to say, we're not supposed to be looking for relationships where women are going to fix us. But, you know, and I, and I think that, that there is a little bit of he's a wounded sparrow, she's going to fix him. Having said that, that's what I like about it, you know? But I, also, I, I mean, I think there's also it gives us a fairly realistic relationship because, I mean, once you do reach a certain age, like how you bond yeah. with someone and how you have friends and how you would find a girlfriend, for example, especially if you've been married and had, you know, that person who you thought was your life mate, soul mate, you know, supposedly taken away from you. It, it's a, a pretty realistic kind of yeah hey, we're at least hanging out, if not more. We, You know, a lot of it could take place off camera because it's not as important, you know, it's more important their kind of relationship that we see. Yeah. Um, it's a real, you know, we have X amount of time, so why don't we, you know, I think it's, it's a really accurate right. representation of relationships at that stage in life. And I think it's, it does that really well. Like, it's a, you know, it's a ghost story, but then it's got stuff like that, that it's fairly realistic. It's really, you know, They're there's a lot of good stuff. They're comfortable on. together. That they, have a lot of, they have a lot of chemistry, these two. And when he comes over to her apartment, you know, to say, hey, get on your gear. We're, we're going to go check out this thing. You know, and she charmingly lives with her mom, which I think is, you know, such an interesting detail. But they know one another's apartment. You're right. Now, it helps, by the way, that these two actors are actually married in real life. Oh, and I love that sure. she and her mom That's come cool. to the come to the uh, yeah come to the the seance. <laughs> she, she brings her mother to the seance. That is the weirdest. There are that that's you know that's the kind of detail that that is hard to devise. You know to just simply go. You know what would be interesting? It would be if she had a mom who kind of serves no purpose at all other than to humanize her, and <laughs> and we just bring her around. That's awesome. I, um, I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about the genre that I think this fits into. And now let me propose something because there's no articles on this per se. I don't think you know maybe someday I'll write a book on this. But I think that what we're looking at with this movie and some other movies is something that I, I and this may have been used before, but I would call it prestige horror. And I, and I've used this before, but and I think prestige horror is a genre that I would say begins around. Exorcist and the Omen in the seventies. Well, would you include Rosemary's Baby? Mm, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Let's let's assume, so maybe. Uh, I I I think I probably have to, but that means pushing it all the way back to nineteen sixty nine, and maybe that's okay. But let's so let's say Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> all the way? Didn't you say nineteen seventy? I, I like think it year. wraps up. I th well, I was thinking, you know, 1973 with The Exorcist, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, okay, Rosemary's Baby is a really good, um, if not the beginning, it's the progenitor. And I think it wraps up around the time of uh, the change, not the changeling really, but actually the legacy, you know, a couple of years after this. So by the mid-'80s, it was over. But what all of these had in common was generally money, um, as Drew was saying earlier, A-list directors, A-list actors, but more than that, a really sumptuous, all, sometimes almost pornographic love for upper-class living. So you see a lot of, like, the insides of private schools, and you see limousines, mansions, and nice clubs. Parties. You know, and all of these, and they're all contemporary. That's another piece of it. It has to be, you know, they're generally non-Gothics, right? And because of the well, this, is, this definitely yeah. veers a lot into Gothic. The, okay, it is Gothic, but it's not a period. It's not a period. It's not. It's not like a right. like a like a like a Bram Stoker's Dracula, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein type movie. No, you're absolutely right. And if I if I think in terms of like Gothic novels, Gothics were often contemporaries, 
But generally, <clears throat> the typical plot of a gothic would be that a female goes, leaves her unhappy life, goes to a great house, learns its secret, um, falls in love with uh, the brooding guy who's in charge of it, and then uh, winds up basically winning the prize. She wins everything. And this, you're right that this is a gothic. It just so happens that the, main, that the gender roles are essentially switched. You know, that's, that it's George C. Scott and not, you know, it's not Nan Barlow from, from Horror Hotel or any of those other characters. Um, that, wow, good job, Drew. It, it never dawned on me that this really is a gothic horror. It's just like literally it's just switched up in, in certain ways. But, yeah, but, but it still fits into this genre I'm talking about of prestige where for a brief moment horror makers were totally in love with this notion of just showing you like first-class horror. You know, and and I suppose it really does come about to the end at the same time that Roger Daltrey chokes to death on a chicken bone in the legacy, and that's and that. I, and by the way, we've got to do the legacy um, because after. Well, don't that, you don't you think it was partly killed by you know the sort of the resurgence of you know teen horror in the eighties with the, with the boom of stuff like Friday the Thirteenth and Nightmare right, on Elm Street? Right. I mean, like a you know we're cheap fast you know, makeup effects driven horror geared at geared at teenagers, you know, something oh, like this. Absolutely. Yeah, I well, think I that, mean I, that and that would right. probably I would you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it kind of follows the same thing with like say punk music at the time, which was kind of reaction to overly produced proggy stuff, you know. So you have these huge gothic things and like, you know, there aren't that that many kids who can relate to, you know, a, you know, George C. Scott it's a very affluent like i mean we we can it's it's interesting but like in general what are you going to go see as a teenager you know yeah. hey am i going to go watch my parent no <laughs> like even though there's, this is wow. movies like this are a cool movie like it is not punk rock like at all and so the reaction to this becomes you know the the kind of teen movie thing of like how do we get more butts in the seat you know oh well teens want to see teens at, at, at a lesser a really amount good. Yeah, and like I, I mean, said, it kind of tracks with like the you know the punk rock movement yeah. was in line with that. Um, you, know, oh, I also, you don't need a ten I also, minute song, etc. Like this is yeah. you know fast and out of control, and I think those movies kind of led to that. Um, well, yeah, I think right. that, I you know I love both, but think you know, of Return of the Living way. Dead is nineteen eighty five, right? And sure. they've got all the all the punk rockers, and they're playing awesome music, you know, and and they've got the hair, and 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 the, you're right. It actually makes me a little bit sad because I know I, I was enough of a geek that I would have watched this movie if it, if I had been a teenager sure. in 1980. But you're right, and I, it might even still be the case. I mean, I'm, I don't know. If I said to you, first of all, I don't know how you would recast this. I've, I have no idea who would play. So you said actually George Clooney, and I think that's a good point. Well, no, that's a good point. Yes. George Clooney would be pretty good in this part. Yeah. So Not that they should remake it. Don't remake The Changeling, Hollywood. Please don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh come on! I, I seriously, I would enjoy seeing George C. Scott in this role. And, you, mean, and you mean George Clooney? I'm sorry, George Clooney. Maybe we saw George C. Scott in this in this role again. It would be a real <laughs> horror movie. But but I would love to see George Clooney and say Julia Roberts, you know, playing these parts. Yeah, and, right. and oh come on! I I, I, <laughs> I, I think that the sort of vibe that this movie has is you know the very thing that you just romanticized and talked about yeah. would be very very difficult to recreate in a contemporary film. It's possible. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, you know, the, the, conjure, the Conjuring did a very good job of, you know, recreating a 1970s, more of a B movie yeah. vibe. You know, so maybe you could do, I mean, maybe you could do this. I, yeah. I, I remain, look, I'm not anti-remake. I'm not, you know, we, 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 I, we, about a year ago this time I talked about how much I like the Wolfman remake and sure. you know, that's a remake that not a lot of people actually like so I, I will go to the bat for a good remake but I just I just don't I just think they'd I think they would screw it up if they tried to do this I think uh, Isabella Rossellini would be awesome as a female wow. lead like she would she has you know enough prestige I think like I, yeah, I would see that movie so I would love to see it I would love to see somebody try but I think Drew's probably right though that somehow there's just in the same in the same sense that that you know it's hard to make a 1950s giant insect movie today and try to capture the feel of those movies you know it's it's hard to like we don't have the same fears and we don't have the same right there's there's a lot into a movie, and I think that sometimes people miss that 
that there are some movies that just are of a time, yes. and it is really hard to reproduce that. And calling something that same name in order to cash in on that, it, it's just hard to, to do. And I think we've talked about it on this show as well. What I've found in talking to people about horror is a lot of people will remake something, yeah. and it seems like a greatest hit, whereas they're not. what they're not doing is going back past whatever that movie was mm. into the, what those people who made that movie were influenced by because that informed them. And so if you only go back, then it's like a carbon copy. Yeah. That's really profound. And and so I think that that too many people will not go back to the source of the source, which is what made uh, which is what made that movie so so cool, right? That's what they were reacting off of. And, you know, we've kind of talked about that, but I think that's the the danger of, hey, we're just going to do this and it's this movie. But, um, but, you know, back to the the thing, you know, I love how it also um, goes from house to house. Like it involves, you know, this other house where they find the body of, Right, the the child. Like, do you want to explain the, where yeah. they find the the, the body? Like, how it's that, in her. How that comes about. It's in her house, right? Like, uh, well, yeah, it's in it's in this extra this other woman's house. In uh, yeah. they get they get a hint. They get a bunch of hints in the séance. One of them is that there was a well. So George C. Scott go, looks. You know, he starts detecting out, going, well, okay, so where was a well? Where was a well that these guys owned? And, and by the way, he figures out pretty quickly what he thinks happened. And, and yeah. most of the movie is just spent with him gathering evidence. I think there's kind of a suspense problem in the movie that, that they give us really the solution way before he manages. No, I, I disagree because I think that they couldn't waste too much time on it. I like that he's smart. I like that he never um, – he doesn't waste any time even – and none of the characters do waste time being, you know, Dana Scully and being like, oh, that's ridiculous. Why would you, even? you know, they pretty much that's a really good point. all say um, from the from the get-go, okay, sure, ghosts, right. Yeah, nobody, for the police, nobody, nobody goes, goes, nobody goes to say, it. right, right. The, the police make fun of the fact that there's a seance. But other than that, you know, he's he immediately, that's what's interesting about this guy. You know, Weird Chet go, goes down in his house, and he immediately just starts. He goes to the real estate person. Goes, anybody ever talk about stuff like this before? There was not a moment where he's like, I do not believe in things like that, and I'm not going to entertain it. Yeah, he's he's completely ready to to get involved in it. But they don't play a really cheesy trope that you see in other movies, where you find out that he only wants to do it so he can maybe talk to his own child. That also doesn't happen. You know, he 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 is open to the spiritual world because of his losses. And, and another another wonderful scene is when he's done all this. He's gone out, he's gotten, he's dug up, he's found the body of the boy in the well, the bones, you know. He's found the necklace. He's tried to approach, um, well, we can the talk senator. about that. But yeah, the senator who is, you know, <laughs> the whole story has to do with, it's kind of the, actually the resolution is kind of complicated and I wasn't that keen on it. But anyway, but the point is he's done all this stuff. He's kind of come up short, but at least he got the bones and everything. Comes back to the house and the, the the ghost throws a total temper tantrum and just starts slamming all the doors. Yes. I just love that scene. And he's like, "What do you want from me? You ungrateful little whatever yes. I remember what he calls him." That, it, it, uh, he calls him something like, "You know, you ungrateful son of a bitch." Yeah, what do you yeah, want yeah. From me? <laughs> <laughs> so great. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. It's great. Um, I was, I like, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. When I was thinking though, like the one thing that you know, because he really tries, does try to help the boy, and and you know how it plays out. But eventually, how it plays out, when everything goes terribly awry, I was thinking like, man, you know, I know that the ghost is distraught, and it, you know, it was not cool to be murdered, but. You know, you're like, George C. Scott tried to help you. Couldn't you at least let him get his stuff out of the house? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> like, you're like, well, never mind that. He, he, like, the, the, the kid straight up murders a cop. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, admittedly, it's but like Polo Coast, and I never trust that guy. But I mean, but it, it's still. The, uh, well, well it isn't. I mean, the cop tries to cover up. Isn't It's the same cop that's trying to cover up. Yeah, he's crooked. Right? He's, he's a crooked Like, he's crooked. Cop. But... <laughs> But in general, like, still, you know, hey, I try to help you, and you burn up all of my crap that I put in your house. Thanks. You know, I, I assume some of it's in storage because he talks about, you know, oh, this is going to storage, is this going to Seattle and stuff. But in general, I the same like, thought. Yeah. in general, the, you're like, man, you, you are kind of a jerk, ghost. Like, yes. he tried to help you, and, like, he confronted a senator in your, on your behalf, like, who threatened to basically bury him. Like, you know, if you tell anything about this, you're through 
in we're, the oh, world. Oh, nothing bury him. You know? We will, we will, you know, we'll get you fired. We'll get you thrown into a mental. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm know? saying. Like he's threatening. <laughs> like you will, you know. This, yeah, you'll just threaten me. This is this is bad. And you he's know, willing to does, do that. And the ghost sort of like burns up all his because the ghost is a child. No, of course. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's a little kid throwing a temper tantrum. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. It's still a jerk though. <laughs> It is, yeah, the ghost. Oh, he's a brat. Needs, but yeah. ultimately, the ghost needs to be just simply set free, so it can go on about whatever business. Now, at so the question end, remains: Does he get free? Because it, the, all this stuff happens. The house burns down. The police guys murdered. Uh, the 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 um the uh the old man who's took. Well, we we should talk kids. about who what what is actually going on here because that's yeah. very important. Well, Drew, would plot. you like to explain the solution to the mystery? Well, what what essentially occurred is that there was a man that had a little boy who was was sickly and crippled. Uh, he did not want a crippled heir, uh, you know. So he drowned the little boy. Which is a horrific scene. In a horrific, oh, yeah. terrible, but one of the, one of the, one of the, truly terrible, and uh, dumped the body in a well. Then went over the Europe. Oh, sorry, he adopted a kid that he is going to then pass off as the son. Takes this kid to Europe, presents him when he is a teenager as the miraculously cured son and and heir to heir to the throne, so yeah. to speak, of this vast uh, fortune and. That's that's in all context. Is this guy needs this kid to live a nice, ripe, long life because the guy himself yeah. has no access to the money except no. as the controller yeah. of the estate for the kid. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I forgot that one little detail. And then this this the, the kid, the replacement kid, the the quote unquote changeling, has gone on to become a senator and all these other things. And it, it really did beg the question to me: is how much does that 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 guy actually know? I mean, obviously he has to know that he's a, he's actually adopted because he wasn't adopted as a little little boy. You know, he was adopted as like an eight year old. So the question is: was it eight or six? It was one of those. So well, how 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 he's pretty small. That's guilty. why he's pretty small. I think, I, know, know, I, I think the character is eight because it goes away for ten years. It comes back. He's eighteen. So well, eight years old. You know, it is conceivable that you could be that you could just simply forget all of the stuff about the. Yeah, I get the impression that he was the way he was groomed and the way that he was adopted and everything. That what the reason he reacts is he doesn't want to remember that because he's. All his life, he's told yeah. that they're, you know, that so you think he's, he's, the son. he's I think that. I think he's repressing right. it, and I, even when he's confronted with it, he, you know, he's like, that can't be true. I'm right. that that will affect so much of because he's, I mean, he's old too, so nobody right. wants to confront that. Well, at the, at the you know, this life. all happened in like 1918. So how old right. do you think this guy is? Melvin Douglas. I mean, so he's yeah. in, he's in his 80s, I suppose, and. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and but and Tony's got it right. He, I think he's like somebody who's been brainwashed. You know, like like a character in one of those movies where somebody gets gets captured by the North Vietnamese and and they're made to think that there's somebody else. And, and you know, it's all down there. You would just have to break through. You know, a ten years they spent with him in Europe, ex- as he grew from eight to eighteen, saying, "You are Joseph Carmichael. You are heir to a great fortune. You're going to be a great." A great leader, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can brainwash somebody in a week, so of course, of years and years and years. You know, Absolutely. Brainwashed. Yeah. So that and that's wonderful because you know there are there are things that that we could do here again. If you imagine this was a long series, and I think my favorite of the movies we. My only about problem was, with that, my only problem with that is yeah. that he has the the woman that's working at the at the real estate agency that's like keeping up on the house, and she's like going, "Oh, well, this guy's." Digging oh, yeah. up on your past, so that's my only problem with that line of thinking is that he doesn't know. The mm-hmm. only possibility that would maintain what we're saying, which is that he doesn't know, or that is that she is just simply a running dog for him because he is a local favorite son. In other words, it's possible that he gets. Well, why would he? Why would he care? Why would he care if somebody was digging up his, his past if he doesn't know no, about it? I, I think. No, what I'm saying is, I don't think he doesn't know about it. What I think about it is if he has to accept that, then he has to accept everything that goes along with that. That's why he fights it. It's not yeah, that he doesn't Drew's remember saying, it. Why would you set it's up just a that guard he's, dog? he's pushed it down so much. Yeah. This is his reaction. Like, he has to confront it all at this really late stage in his life. And, and also, it means he loses the money. <laughs> like, yeah. all the – his – 
all of his power, the other reason he, you know, reacts this way is all of his power is wrapped up in him being the son. Yeah. Um, and it would mean, you know, his dad's a murderer. <laughs> Nobody yes. wants to, he doesn't want to confront that either. So there's all I, I love the way George like, D. Scott says it where he goes, none of this belongs to you. <laughs> Yeah, you know. Well, also, I like how he's like, oh, I've, you know, I know that you're here to blackmail. And George C. Scott's like, no, I'm not. He's like, I, uh, he's like in payback. He's like, I want seventy thousand dollars, and everybody's like, what? Why seventy? Like, no, you want more than that. <laughs> but he actually like, does try to buy George C. Scott off. But I, I, sure. I, and, and George C. Scott is like, no. He's like, no, I don't. That's not why I'm here. And the guy that that makes him more even more livid because he realizes like where the power shift actually is. If this yeah. guy's like, you know, because to him everybody's got a price, of course, right? Um, and so that makes him even more angry. Um, it's a, it's 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 so classy, and it's really it really is a pure. I mean, almost to the level that this could be an episode of you know uh, of masterpiece theater or something. You know that it's in the end it is a mystery. George C. Scott is going to solve. He has no interest in making any money. He just has a very demanding client that he wants to, that he needs to help. And, um, and he does. And that, and that comes to an end. And as Julia was pointing out, once, once uh, Melvin Douglas, the senator, realizes and remembers everything and accepts that he is, Joseph that Carmichael he is this guy, that, he, that he is the second Joseph Carmichael, mm -hmm. then he dies of a heart attack as uh, George C. Scott sees his astral projection, his ghost, as it were, walk into the flames of the house that the ghost has finally set on fire. <laughs> what, what that's, a, that that's an awesome, that, man, the <laughs> fire scene. Oh, and the, and the, the other scene, though, where uh, George C. Scott's girlfriend gets chased by the wheelchair. Yes. That. Mm-hmm. That is so Actually, to be honest with you, well Tony, handled and I, scary. Like I don't know, it works for me. I I mean I guess it's scary. I'm not knocking that, it, but I could have done without it. I kind of felt like it was to me that scene was a bridge too far. I was like, this is strictly exploitative. It, it's just here to get an extra scare because we're kind of spending honestly. Money. If they had more stuff different. like that, where I felt some like. I never for once feel like George C. Scott seems like he's in danger. So if they had more stuff like that, I feel like the movie would have been scarier. I understand what you're saying about that being maybe too exploitative. But, you know, like you're, you're, you're talking about like the classiness of these movies. No movie is more in your face than The Exorcist. Yeah. None. But I, and, like the, I like that George C. Scott's not in danger because the whole point is that the ghost is, is wanting his help. It's no, I agree. Him. I agree with you. I'm saying, I'm just saying, and I like the movie as it is, but and I'm saying it's, it's, is not, it's and, not, it's not, you know, that's the reason why I was saying initially that I, I didn't think it was a scary movie. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not saying that, so Tony's right. It's very effective. I felt like it's, I was torn because, yeah, I thought it was scary, but I also felt like like you could probably do without it plot wise. Plot wise, you could live. Well, certainly, is it. memorable enough that they put the wheelchair on the poster. Well, that's yeah, the good. wheelchair is important because it was his wheelchair when he was sickly, and it's not the, the no, other. No, but you're right. You're right. The ghost is acting out. And right, it's, it's, and I mean, I, I don't <laughs> think it. I think it's. I think it's pretty arbitrary for you to say that that's exploitative because it, that's nothing. It's not that different from anything else. So, I mean, he kills a free, a, a what's him a doodle, um cop. You know, that's exploitative. I guess I don't actually know Again, if I would say that. Again, Don Colacos deserves to be done away with <laughs> in whatever movie he is. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, but so at the end, he burns down the house, and then uh, presumably because the senator has died and the truth has been told and all that, um, the ghost can rest. But then in the ruins of the mansion, the uh, this music box has been important to the to plot because um, it was it was one of the ways that the ghost communicated to to John is that John started writing this music, which is actually this in this music box, and he thought he was writing it from his own creative. Please. Um, anyway, this music box just suddenly opens up and starts playing. And so my question is, does that mean that he's does that just like does that mean that he's still there? He's not at rest. And Jason no. was saying no. I I, I first of all, do, I, do you want my explanation inside or outside the world? Outside the world, this is just a rip off of Carrie. That's all this is. <laughs> this is just a nice little thing where they're going to scare you with with you know. But in that case, it was a dream, and it was just because they wanted another stinger at the end. My feeling in the world, no way this haunting is still going on. The hunting's done. It's done. It's done. Well, there's no house. I mean, it's a homeless <laughs> ghost. <house. laughs> exactly. Hobo ghost. There's a. Yes. You can hang out with fire shark. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll just right. wander. 
wander the hillside here in Seattle. But I, I really believe that what this is is intended to be a sort of a final goodbye from the ghost, like literally – like at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream, this is the ghost saying, you know, if we spirits have offended, think that this and all is mended. You know, it's a little like, epilogue. It's, yeah, it's yeah. just a, a sort of little bow. It's like we've talked about before, the you know, Michael Landon saying, you know, stopping and saying Happy Halloween at the end of his Halloween episodes, uh, of, you know, heaven, whatever the heaven thing was. Where he was Highway to Heaven. Highway, Highway to Heaven. heaven. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I think it would have probably... It would have been Hayes not at rest if it had been the wheelchair and not the music box. Right. I think the fact that the music box changes that dialogue, in my right. opinion. Yeah, it, there's no way this, go, this haunting is still going on. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I feel satisfied that they took pretty good care of this kid. Yeah. Well, then that brings us to the end, so. Yes, when that is the end. And, okay, and, and, I, mean, um, I don't think we have anything else to no, you're right. We should we should actually get final thoughts and uh thank you for keeping us sort of on our time. Uh let's get final thoughts and then come around for endorsements. So we went I think we started with Julia for once and, and so let's go Julia, Tony, Drew, and uh, I'll drop something. So Julia, the changeling. Well, so like I like I've said, um there's a couple little things that I would change but for the most part, uh and like the main thing I would change is that the house is just too big, but I guess that's because that's why it's a haunted house is that if it wasn't but you can have a haunted house that's smaller, but whatever. Anyway, but the little things that I didn't that I would have changed uh, don't detract from it. I think it's a great picture. Yeah, no. Um all right, Drew, what do you uh no wait, I mean sorry. You're skipping Tony. over Tony. Tony, final thought. Um yeah, I really like it. I, I like the detective stuff. Um, I I think the characters are all, like, really nicely realized. Um, yeah, and, you know, there's a few kind of – it's kind of up or down. It's not a perfect movie. But as far as, like, uh, you know, a good creepy movie, it does a really great job. Um, it's really excellent. I, I really enjoy it. I think the sound design, again uh, – you know, ups the creep factor for the parts that need to be Absolutely. creepy in the beginning, like that gonging sound of the of the tub slash whatever. Mm-hmm. It's really oh man, it's so effective and so cool. Uh, there's there's lots of great bits, and I think that that's part of why I think it would make such a great uh, double feature with the haunting. Um, I agree, yeah. That would be really really cool. Um, but yeah, I I really I really enjoy the movie. It's worth it's worth checking out and adding to the kind of creepy Halloween October if you're watching a bunch of movies. I think it should be in in your list absolutely no it should be uh drew final thoughts for the change again this is a great palate cleanser after the abysmal shit of sinister (laughs) and um i i really liked it again to me this is more of a supernatural mystery than a horror film but i think it's a very good supernatural mystery uh george c scott again is excellent in this movie and uh, you know anybody this is probably the most different this is kind of an even though it hits a lot of the, the haunted house genre notes it's it's probably the most different of any of the movies that we've watched like it's it's because it does have that uh detective aspect to it and also because it, it deals the way it deals with grieving, you know, and I think because it's, it, it is both a classic uh, haunted house movie and a haunted house movie that kind of stands out from the rest, it, that those two things uh, make it a very interesting film. And I'm, I'm glad we did this. I, I, I think this is a fun movie to talk about. Thank you. Me too. I, the, I know that it, it's tiresome when we always just love a movie, but I really love the classiness of this film and, and the moods of it, the sadness of it, the grayness of it. Everything about this film is just very, it's its very magnetic to watch. I, I, I have to, you know, I, I keep coming back to it, and it's absolutely one of my favorites, even though it is enormously sad. Um, so, and in, a, in the end, somewhat hopeful uh, by, by the time it comes around. So I want to do endorsements. I want to find out what is that thing that you guys have been enjoying uh, over the the past week and thinking about that you want to share with our listeners. So let's go the same direction, Joya, Tony, Drew, and I'll go. Joya, anything to endorse this time around? Um, Well, we watched a delightful family film called Book of Life, if you haven't heard of it. Um, It's an animated movie about the Dia de los Muertos, and it's it's so much fun. It's a really cute film. and uh, it, I just I recommend it if you if, even if you're not a kid, <laughs> but we, we enjoy, adults enjoyed it as well. Absolutely, no, I liked it too. Uh, Tony endorsement? Yeah, I have to say I have enjoyed the uh, director's cut of Nightbreed, um, mm. which I need to I should if 
if you don't have it, Drew, we should check it out. Um, yeah. More you. restoration, like, even above what they did when I saw the Cabal Cut last year that I had talked about. Um, yeah, it's really good. And then also the big one is Drew and I – probably me more so, are going to be at Housecore Horror Fest uh, looking at movies so that we can review for for this uh, podcast, you know, for the website. And, you know, we're going to try to get some interviews here and there where we can. Uh, mainly, I think film will be our, our main focus. But, you know, if any of the bands, we're able to catch a band that we can interview, we're going to do that too. So thanks to Housecore for having us. Uh, that's a big, you know, awesome thing to, to get to report on this and, and really, you know, push I, that. I, I actually, so that's going to be really, really awesome. I hope you do some, some interviews. I think that that'd be fantastic. And, and we'll, we can put them up both ways. If you do like some interviews with people, and I think I'll be doing some of these as well, we'll do them as special episodes of the podcast that will just go up between between the episodes so people might have something to tie them over. And also um, we can put them on the YouTube channel. So that'll be that's a great idea. If, if the listener thinks that this is a particularly good idea, let us know because we think it's something that will connect with the listener, but it uh, you know, still remains to be seen. Yeah, <laughs> and, we, you know, and also if there's anybody in, in Austin who digs the show, um, we'll be around. So, you know, hit us up on Facebook. Like I'll be checking, you know, with my phone, like, you know, if there's somebody, hey, I'm also a fan, you know, we're willing to meet and hang out. That's one thing we did. I think, you know, we put up that uh, interview with Final Drive, and I'd like to do more stuff like that where we're talking to fans and we want to know what you dig about horror and fill us in on stuff. You know, we have a, a fairly informal show in general, and I like kind of keeping it Absolutely. keeping it like that. And so, you know, we're definitely accessible, and, you know, we're fans as well. So, you know, if you are at Housecore and you do listen to this, you know, hit us up on the Facebook page and let us know what you're seeing as well and maybe we can hang out, talk movies and music and everything else. I'm pretty psyched because there's a lot of great bands as well. Um, it's going to be really cool. Very cool. Mr. Drew, anything to endorse? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I uh, they just did a mega dump of several seasons of The Walking Dead on uh, Netflix and it's been actually years since I've watched that show, so I've had a, had a good old time playing catch up with it. And honestly, I feel like uh, I, I guess it's season three and season four that are up there. I feel like the, actually the show has uh, greatly improved. The, you know, they introduced the the character of the governor, which is a character from the comic, and he's played by David Morrissey. And uh, they did, you know, he doesn't look at all like the character from the comics, which I know some people are like, oh, where's his handlebar mustache and mullet? But I, I think uh, I think David Morrissey does an excellent job uh, bringing bringing some some humanity to the character, and I I, I was very impressed with that. Uh, I also have to I'm doing an advanced plug, but the last uh, from the 27th to the 31st, uh, MonsterVerse is going to be having a comicsology sale. Uh, it's going to be a coupon co- code sale, which I will post once on, on the Facebook group once I have that. Not only is all of the Halloween Man stuff going to be severely marked down, but all of the MonsterVerse stuff. That's all of Flesh and Blood, all of the Legosis Tales from the Grave, uh, all of Scarlet, like uh, the Weird West, like all of those titles are going to be marked down. You can go and check out all of the MonsterVerse books. And I hate to sound like too much of a cheerleader for the company I work for, but MonsterVerse has some excellent uh, titles if you're a genre fan. I mean, yep. these are books I would be reading if I was not uh, a part of are the company. Are the back issue stuff like the Bela Lugosi presents yes. uh, books about? Yes. Fantastic. No, those are wonderful. You, so please get on there, check out Halloween Man, uh, check out I love Flesh and Blood. Flesh and Blood is an amazing series and they have the first two issues up there. Uh, you know, the, the issues are just enormous. But you should you should check out all of the MonsterVerse titles. Flesh and Blood is really great. That's pretty amazing because that's a series that posits a universe basically where everything in the horror, uh, in the Hammer Horror universe, sort of is happening more or less simultaneously. So that, yeah, it's it's very very cool. So you have several characters who represent people that Peter Cushing played in 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 the movies. It's neat. Yeah, it's a very it's a, it's a very cool series. Um, well, cool. well, and I think something that the Penny Dreadful fans would probably get a lot of enjoyment out of, for sure. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Better than Penny. I I, I got to give one one more for for those of you who are not going to be at House Core twenty four seven. I got to give 
one more shout out. My wife is doing a weekly uh, karaoke thing at uh, Spinner's Live on Sunday, 7 to 11. That's Rockabilly Rockout Karaoke. I went last week. I had an amazing time. I also learned that I am equally good singing uh, Hank Williams as I am doing Frankenfurter, which is mind-blowing <laughs> to me. Uh, so if you're in the Austin area and you want to, you know, something free and fun on Sunday night, you should you should come out and hang out with my wife because I'm sure this week will be equally entertaining. Oh, that does remind me. Before. Um, I do want to give another shout out, and I know I've been hitting this up, but uh, the director of Phil Mucci is going to have his retrospective at House Core, and it, I think it's before uh, the karaoke thing you're talking about. So you, it's even possible to do both. But and what are the his dates on retro- House Core again, though? But what? When does it go on, House Core? I, uh, House, House Core, Core is, is Friday, Saturday, um, and Sunday. Yeah. Okay. But Sunday night. Uh, video director and online friend. I'm hoping to hang out with him. What, one of my favorite video directors at this point, um, Phil Mucci, is doing a retrospective. Um, I, I think I posted a couple times on our site and stuff like that. Sure. But I'm really excited. That's that's other than some of the bands and like some of the cool horror movies and like. What, the, what, the, what, time, does Danzig, what time does Danzig play? Like that's that's, um, that's I, that night. You know, I don't. I mean, it'll be late. Is, that is he night, Friday or is he Sunday? It's Sunday, I believe. Oh, Sunday, 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 Sunday. <laughs> so there's a lot going on, but but I, you know, I'm definitely like, you know, getting to meet Phil in person because we talked a lot online. He's definitely one of the people. If I if I had money to just throw at somebody to make a video for Desert to Mars, he would be the first person I would go to, <laughs> like hands down. Um, and so. And he's done, you know, shorts and he's done videos. And so he's going to have a whole Q&A and everything with, you know, he has the star of some of his videos. And he's done, you know, stuff for High on Fire, for his most recent with Monster Magnet. He did Huntress. He did, um, you know, several others. Pig Destroyer, I think, was another uh, band he's done stuff for. And, um, lots and of what's great, the venue? Where the, cool uh, stuff. Um, where it's the... Emo's, Emo's East is where uh, the stuff. There's... So all this now, now, it's now the only Emo's. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's always, but it's always been termed. I guess it's always been. I yeah, always, I, I mean, it's emo it to me. Like, I don't know that I'll ever think of it as emo, but yeah. it's, uh, but it's yeah. all there and on that, you know, housecorehorrorfestival dot com, if I'm not mistaken. And we'll post. They have the post that, but... they have the entire ca- original cast of uh, living, I should say, um, but the living cast of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre there. Yeah, I mean, there's is, a lot of good stuff. Yeah. That, you know, we want to we want to cover, and I'm always, you know, if I'm going to be a press for a place, I'm, you know, there to cover it. Uh, you know, again, since Fantastic Fest, I'm... I, I hope you get some interviews. I, I think it'll be good to put up some, some, some great things. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to, to do that. I, you can you just know. get people and, and, you know, get people to just say things about their favorite kind of horror movie. We can get it. That's, that's the plan right now yeah. so but uh you know we hope to see people there but there's lots of great stuff and and i'm really but like i said you know the reason i plug in uh phil is just because i i really believe in his mashup of you know kind of horror and sci-fi tropes along with you know heavy music and his style is something that i think a lot of people need to see and so i know i've been posting a lot about it but i'm i'm really psyched that they gave uh a, you know a video director and a, a fairly new video director and you know when you think about you know, the cast of Texas Chainsaw Massacre is going to be there. Like, there's a really good mix of new and old. And so I'm I'm super psyched for his uh, retrospective. And so also, if you're, you know, if you're going, uh, please go to his thing, um, to his panel. Cause it, and, you know, I really believe in it. So we like Very to support good. cool people who, you know, he's been awesome. And I'm, I'm pretty, pretty stoked about that. Outstanding. Um, okay, my endorsements are a little more, uh, I don't know, Gen- not generic's not the word. National might be a perfectly valid word. So that no matter where you are, uh, you can check out the things that I've been checking out. So two things that I want to that I want to mention. Um, for one thing, I've been listening to a new podcast called Serial, which I find to be super addictive. I think I just listened to the fifth episode. It's been running so it's been running I guess for five weeks. It is a spinoff of This American Life, but it is Sarah Koenig, producer, um, investigating one murder that happened 15 years ago. And she's, you know, she's investigating the witnesses. She's trying to work out whether the guy who's in prison is the one who really did it. Sometimes she leans more towards, yes, he did it. And sometimes she leans more towards, oh, maybe it's impossible that he's in. Ultimately, it's about, you know, in 1999, during one 20-minute period, somebody strangled a 16-year-old girl and, and then buried her in the woods. And is it the guy who is sitting in prison or, or not? And it's really, really cool to listen to her sort of, spend an 
an hour talking about the alibi and spend an hour talking about the timeline. It's great. It's this wonderful experiment in seeing if you can do an entire series about one topic and really dig deep into it. So I've been impressed by that. The other one, so this weekend I'm, I'm going to be uh, giving a, a talk on the history of Halloween and, and the meaning of horror at the Columbine uh, Unitarian Universalist Church in uh, Littleton, Colorado. And before that, I'm going to be reading a children's book. And so I've been rediscovering the monster at the end of this book. This is a uh, book that you must classic. read. The monster at the end of this book is amazing because it is suspenseful, because there is a monster at the end of this book. So, <laughs> so I recommend this. It is actually delightful. And, and you're looking it's at Sarah it again. Grover, lovable for you. Absolutely. Grover. And I remember doing the voices. I remember all that stuff that we used to do when the girls were, were tiny. And I'm going to act, have to actually read this book aloud to an entire, like, to a bunch of children, like, sitting in a circle. And, and, uh, and adults. And to a gathered, <laughs> right, into a gathered congregation. And, uh, and, and so I've been trying to decide whether to do all the voices like I would do when the girls were little. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I don't have Why to not? Think. Yeah, sure. I think I think you're obligated at this yeah, point. It, it would also be kind of fun to do like John Milkovich Malkovich style asides where I could stop and go, you know, here he's making a very strong, solid brick wall. And then I could go, you know, it's interesting how many monsters we've seen over time who were actually walled up alive, which used to be something. That no. <laughs> I did not do that. Henry, in fact, was walled away alive in 1411. No. So I, I vote no. That's just not thinking about it. Let me stop the book here for a second to note. (laughs) Yes, no, but The Monster at the End of this book, always a classic. Um, Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Come to our Facebook page and let us know what you want to talk about, what you think, how you disagree with the last thing we talked about, what you want to see coming up. Please. And how much you love it when I hate things. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> and um, uh, leave, uh, please leave us reviews. We totally need reviews, and the best place to leave reviews is on iTunes because everybody else picks up the reviews from iTunes and scatters them around, so it helps people find the show. Um, tell your friends. Bring your friends along. Sneak into their rooms and just start playing the podcast and, like, sneak back out, and they'll feel like they <laughs> must listen um, or they'll be totally creeped out of why right. why this ghost has suddenly decided to start playing haunted house podcasts. Yes. Them. So uh, <laughs> so if if we get and you know we're getting close to another milestone in listeners on the on the Facebook page. I think if we pass the next milestone, perhaps we will make one of those four person jib jab videos with all of our faces. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we should just do that for Halloween anyway. <laughs> all right. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful wonderful evening, and we will see you next week. Bye, Bye. guys. Night. Bye.